Young host of Your Money Story here on Quick Take and welcome to Friday or whatever other day that you are watching this. But hey, listen, we've been talking a lot about generational wealth, teaching kids how to budget, teaching kids how to become money smart. But what about some of the mistakes you encounter along the way to becoming debt free, to becoming money smart? Well, Found the perfect guest to talk about that. Her name is Bridget, pardon me, Sarah Wilson. And she goes as Budget Girl on social media. You can see her as at Go Budget Girl. And the reason why she's such an excellent person to talk about this topic is because she's been completely transparent about her journey from the beginning to the end. And so I wanna invite her in right now to join us. Let's see, go, go budget girl is right here, Sarah Wilson. We're gonna wait for her to come on shortly. <gasps> Hello, welcome to the show. <laughs> Thank Hi, you. thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much. I am so sorry about that, <laughs> but we want to talk about mistakes here. And I thought that it was so incredible that you go so far as to let us into your spreadsheets every month. Um, not a lot of people do that. And not a lot of people in general like to talk about their mistakes. But before we get to that, I want to know a little bit more about your money story. Now, you didn't necessarily come from money, uh, nor did you guys talk about it a lot at home. Um, so tell me what it was like growing up in the Wilson household and how you related to money coming up. So growing up, I think I probably had a fairly normal childhood, but we never talked about money. I didn't get an allowance. If I needed something, I had to ask. And sometimes I got it. Sometimes I didn't. And hi, Bernie. And I uh, just never really knew about money. I went off to college and we never even really had a discussion about what would happen there. I took out student loans. I never learned to budget. I had like a few odd jobs in high school and I just kind of spent money as I had it. And if I didn't have any money, I didn't spend it. So I was in a uh, bit of a pickle when I went off to college. I didn't have quite enough scholarships to cover everything. So I took off some extra student loans to live off of at the advice of some of my peers. Mm. And, uh, yeah, ended up graduating with about $26,000 in debt. And then the government said that I didn't have to pay anything on it because I was making so little as a newspaper reporter. <laughs> in a couple of years, it ballooned up to thirty-three grand, And suddenly I found myself laid off from a newspaper job, thirty-three wow. k in debt, on unemployment. And I swore to myself that I would have to make some major changes when it came to money. And I did. You did. And so how you, first of all, managed to, I know that you found another newspaper job making the same salary, right? And how you managed to pay off $33,000 in debt from a salary of 26 k uh, I need you to tell us first how you managed your finances to even be able to do that. I first off made a budget, which is probably why I go by the moniker budget girl on YouTube. Ding, ding, ding. And, <laughs> yeah. and so I was dealing with $1,400 a month. Mm. That's all I made. And so that's kind of the first money mistake I wanted to talk about is waiting until you have more money to budget your money. Mm. Um, I think it's a mistake I hear a lot. And people are like, I don't make enough to budget. It's actually the less you make, the more imperative it is because you don't have as much wiggle room for mistakes. Mm. When you actually make a budget and you're saying, all right, this is what every single bit that's coming in is going to do. It's this really cool thing. You actually can accomplish those things. Mm -hmm. And usually you end up with a little bit more than you thought you had just because you're being a better steward of your resources. That's exactly what many personal finance advocates say, you know, and I can say myself that I've heard over the years friends who go, oh, I don't make enough money to have a budget, or, you know, they, they don't understand the necessity of having a plan, period. Um, of course, mm -hmm. they've all learned more since then, uh, but now you eventually found out after you did begin to pay this debt off, 
um, you sacrificed your desired career um, because you found out that, hey, making 26K a year is not going to cut it, even though you paid off $33,000 in three years um, in debt. Um, and you said that multiple streams of income is really is really it like take us through the mindset <laughs> shift you know mo take us through the mindset shift that it, that even after you've paid off the debt with a very small salary um and you were able to make that shift after that yeah so paid off 10k a year on 26k um by side hustling adding in kind of the many streams of income that we all hear of you know i picked up a job delivering pizzas for a while i did some secret shopping i did some essentially uh a uh, dog training and some other like anything anyone would hire me for I picked up on nights and weekends and that was a lot of work I then moved to another town where I was making 30k a year woo 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 and <laughs> paid off the rest of my debt and then I decided you know newspaper industry I'm sure you know media is just having a really hard time it right is. now and you're to do more and more and more for less, less, less money. And I have a few decades left in my career, I'm thinking, so I decided to pivot to uh, university communications. And I actually really, really love it. I now make 50K a year, and I'm still side hustling. Yeah. I have my budget girl business. I am investing now. I actually own a duplex now yes. in Texas. I am a landlord, and I have rental income coming in that covers my entire mortgage plus 150 bucks a month. So I make money off of living in a house that I own. Absolutely, house hacking, right? And so like while we're talking about it, honestly, while we're talking yeah. about it, you know, I have some close friends who are also considering house hacking. For these guys, what's like the number one thing that you think they need to know before they enter into this process? savings hmm. make i actually i have personal savings i'm it after that whole story that y'all just heard i have savings on savings on savings and i find it one of the most important things to sleep at night and so i have a personal emergency fund and i now have a duplex emergency fund hmm. so anything that happens with the house an appliance goes out problem with the roof something like that i've got a fund just sitting there waiting to fix it That's just throw money at the problem brilliant i never thought of that you know and so like how do you calculate how much you need for that duplex emergency fund? Um, I started out with 10K and it just didn't feel right. Uh, so I bumped it to 15 and that feels pretty good because okay. that that'll honestly cover a new roof if I need it, okay. which is pretty much the worst thing that can happen. It you know, is. Cover, like, <laughs> that deposit, is. insurance, like I'm good. That would cover easily six plus months of vacancy if something were to happen any sort of issue like that. So a lot of it's kind of figuring out where your comfort level mm. is. And we talked about this before, figuring out what your money security needs are to feel good and be able to go about your life in kind of a winning mindset and way of, I don't have to worry about that. I'm covered mm -hmm. on that. I'm prepared for what might happen there. The same mindset applies to building up your emergency fund. You know, some mm -hmm. people go three to six months. Some people are like, listen, I'm not comfortable unless I have a whole year. Um, and yeah. so I'm guessing that you would say that you yeah. say whatever your comfort level is, you do yeah. that. And you can build it up. You can start with a month. And honestly, when I started and I had just a thousand dollars as a savings account that I didn't touch unless it was an absolute emergency, I slept better at night yeah. and I felt better just going through life because I knew if something blew up in my car or I busted a tire or I had to go to the emergency room, mm -hmm. I had at least that little bit of fund that would cover it. And therefore I didn't have to worry about how far off path my life would suddenly careen because I didn't have enough money to deal with an issue. Yep, yep. And so then quickly back to the side hustles. You noted this. You still side hustle. You're still a dualpreneur. Go Budget Girl is an actual business that you make yeah. money off of. Um, and so then what is the top piece of advice that you would give for people who are going into these different side hustles? Um, I've heard ranges from find something you like to do and do that more than anything else or figure out how to monetize your own personal talents. Um, but what, what do you say? Those are both really great pieces of advice. Um, I started the way most people start with trying to side hustle, which is low, low skill jobs. You know, I delivered pizzas and stuff until I could build up 
this business until I could save up for the rental and these other bigger money things. So I would say think of scale if you want to start a woodworking business because that is your passion and your talent. Don't all of a sudden go and spend like five grand on marketing for it and everything like that. Mm -hmm. Cash flow your business as you're able to build things and sell them. You know, figure that out as you go along and use it. Use cash flow to elevate and reinvest in your business. So don't go whole hog into a business idea that might not turn out. Gotcha. Very, very sound mm -hmm. advice. And then, so let's get to more of the mistakes. <laughs> like the mistake that you shared before, is that your biggest mistake? If not, what is your biggest money mistake that you've made? It was, it was honestly the taking out student loans to live off of. I don't know where that money went to tell you wow. completely honestly. It was about a thousand bucks a semester that I took out on top of what I needed for school and books and everything. And honestly, it probably went to Taco Bell if we're being <laughs> <laughs> Taco Bell and like sorority gifts yeah. and just midnight Walmart trips. Mm -hmm. And I didn't, I didn't need that stuff. Um, I would have much rather have not had to pay, you know, three or four times the amount yeah. for that several years later. And I wish I had, I wish I had known about money sooner Yep, and known about really utilizing it and how much debt would really cost me because I'm now on the other side where I don't have any debt at all other than my mortgage, which is paid for by other people. Mm -hmm. And I have investments that are compounding every single month. So I'm on the positive side of the compound interest, and it's just amazing very how much my net worth grows every month, even though I don't make a billion dollars. I make a very normal salary, but because I don't have all my money going to debt, it's able to really grow for me, which is such a blessing. Important to note that because I saw on your Insta page, you just reached a milestone in your net worth, um, and, <laughs> and it matters because of where you came from. So congratulations on that. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. And so also when we look at mistakes, one that you said was a big one was people doing way too much too soon, all at the same time. Tell us about about all that. What is team too much about? Team too much. I love that. <laughs> so a lot of people, they get really jazzed about personal finance. They're like, all right, I'm going to make a budget. I'm going to um, pay off my debt but I'm also gonna credit card hack for the points. I'm gonna invest in crypto and other stuff. And what they end up doing is diffusing their efforts out. It's kind of mm. like stacking up a row of dominoes and you're like, I wanna knock over all these dominoes and you're just going. Oh, <laughs> it's not really that's working. a good analogy. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. So I believe in the power of focus. So, and you can also build things up. You can build things up. I now have seven streams of income, mm. close to eight. And I can do those things because I've built up over time and once you do something for a while it becomes a lot easier so you have your dominoes if these are your debt then you want to focus all of your efforts on one pay all of your minimums but focus all of your extra efforts on one all of a sudden it knocks over you then get to utilize everything you were saying there at the next one next thing you know all your dominoes are gone mm -hmm. and you have all of that money to do what you want which is the coolest thing so i think a lot of people get too excited about hacking and that house hacking is the best thing ever, but I couldn't have done that while I was still in debt. Mm -hmm. uh, I waited until I, after I was done and I had the money to cash flow and deal with any issues or problems and renos. And it ended up being a really positive thing for me instead of stress. Cause also when you diffuse all of your efforts, it's too much to keep hold of. Yeah. Way too much. Curveball here. Let's talk about student loan debt a little bit. Some, oh, sure. some people may call it a pandemic of its own, right? And there are people with six-digit student loan debt. I ask this question to a lot of people just because I need to hear all the different perspectives. Um, do you suggest folks with six-figure student loan debt wait to invest? Or should they invest at the same time as paying off that debt? Well, I, most of my audience is a little bit lower to mid income. So that's the advice set that I give for them is to focus on one thing at a time, because when you only have a few resources, you want to throw them at one thing to get it done. And then you can move on. Okay. If you have six figures in debt, I'm hoping you also have a six figure income. And in that case, if it's going to take you five, six, 10 years maybe to pay that off, then you might need to make sure that you're also doing some retirement savings because that's going to happen whether you like it or not. Mm -hmm. And a little bit of other stuff. It, 
personal finance is incredibly personal. So I think a lot of people who go out there, especially experts and gurus who are like, this is the plan. And if you don't do this exact plan, you're a dumbo. Um, I think that's not the best advice. I think mm. you need to take your personal situation and figure out what is going to work the best for you while keeping in mind your personal financial security needs and the actual numbers matter. Yeah. The actual numbers absolutely matter. Mm -hmm. So am I going to tell anyone to forego their uh, company security match or 401k match for five years while they're paying off debt? No, mm. that's free money that you're missing out on. But yeah. <laughs> no, no, you brought up such a brilliant point. Um, something that you've also said before that another huge mistake that people make is not customizing their plans to fit their lives because what works Absolutely. for this guy over here might not work for this lady over here because may, not only do they not make the same income or don't have the same debt to income ratio, but he may have five children, right? Or, and she may care for an elder uh, parent. Um, and so just the situations are so different and it's so important, as you say, to make sure you customize. Um, so thank you for bringing that up too. And so another one um, I wanna ask you about is making decisions based off of, this kind of relates to what you just talked about, making decisions based off of what influencers say or having financial FOMO. Uh, tell me what that's all about. So it, I, <laughs> By by many standards, I would be considered a micro influencer. I have almost 100,000 followers on uh, YouTube, about 50,000 here on Instagram. And so I get approached by companies all the time that would like me to shill for them. And I am very, very careful about who I am willing to um, talk about or represent because so much of what you see online and from people that you're watching through this free entertainment like Instagram and YouTube is sponsored in some way <laughs> and a lot of it is. um there are laws that we have to disclose those things and i always absolutely do but what someone is pitching you as the solution to your all of your life's problems is not always the best thing for you mm -hmm. and just because you see people going on these lavish vacations and wearing all of these designer brands does not mean that that is necessarily the life that is best for you and for your finances mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so um i mean i've even fallen prey to it i've seen people going and doing things. And I'm like, I wish I could do that. But you know, I still have a full time job. I can't take that much vacation days. I can't go live in Cabo for a month. Mm. But I also have to remember that my personal finances and my money goals are set in place to build the life that I want. Mm -hmm. And as long as I'm working towards those that I'm winning, yeah. versus trying to constantly keep up with the Joneses is one of the older sayings or Kardashians, yep. I guess. Yeah, you know, the Joneses, they come in every generation and everyone wants to keep up with them. So wait, let's take some questions really quickly. You've got a lot of a lot of people here who oh, <laughs> support you. Let me look and find out if anyone has any questions. Let's check out a few. Oh, this is a good one. Someone asks, do you go for the biggest loan or the highest interest rate to pay off first? So I'm guessing the biggest loan amount that you have once you're doing, sounds like the snowball method you <laughs> described. Yeah. Um, do you go for the highest well, amount versus or the avalanche. highest interest? Yeah. Right, or avalanche, correct. So mm -hmm. which one do you go to? Um, so I paid off snowball method. I had a $4,000 loan and like a $22,000 loan. And I just found it, the the $4,000 loan was lower interest, but I just wanted to get it out of the way. I just never wanted to think about it again. Mm -hmm. um, that said, if you've got a bunch of debt, I say utilize your money the best way possible. Go avalanche. Go highest interest debt first. Kick that out of the way, and you will then have more money to throw at your other stuff. Mm -hmm. Personal opinion, once again, personalize it to your life and your situation. If one of those debts is like a family loan or something that you need to get out of the way, even if it's no interest, that you need to get out of the way for better relations, yeah. stick that top of the pile, <laughs> absolutely. Yep, important to note that too, as well as private versus public loans. It's just so many different things. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the reasons why we talk to so many different mm -hmm. folks about specifically paying off loans is because of that. We want to expose people to different options. Let's see if we have another question here. 
Let's see what else. A lot of people are just giving a whole lot of support for you because you have a ride or die community. Uh, oh, yeah. Fantastic. I love them. You know, New video came out today, so hopefully they're online. <laughs> right. I think this is a good practical, um, that a question that will, will bring a very good practical answer. Someone asks, how about earning during this pandemic, uh, during lockdown specifically? What kind of side hustle do you think people can look for? I have some ideas in my mind, but I want to hear what you say. Oh, yeah. I'd love for you to chime in. There's, too. <laughs> There's a lot of um, virtual things that you can do, even just Fiverr. I know Fiverr does not pay a ton, but you can actually set your own pricing. I'm never going to tell people to go do those little surveys where you have to like earn 100 <laughs> points in surveys to get a dollar. That is not worth your time, okay. friends. But <laughs> um, DoorDash and other delivery things are always paying. Uh, my boyfriend actually right now is doing some door dashing and he keeps getting this surge pricing because people don't want to go out. Mm -hmm. They want to get their stuff delivered to them. Once again, Fiverr virtual assisting services. Um, VIP kid pays like $16 an hour. If you have any experience with education or teaching children in any way, you can do that. Mm -hmm. Teaching English online and that pays pretty well. And I know a lot of people who are doing that. Okay. Very good That's examples good. here. I think that I will ask one more question so that we can wrap a little bit. And one guy asks, I hear a lot that money sitting in savings isn't doing anything for you. Is there a special kind of account or investment plan that you use so that that safety net can keep working for you or growing more? Um, and I heard on a recent podcast that you have what like 10 different <laughs> 10 different accounts <laughs> um this goes back to like my personal lease i am actually converting some of my savings into more investment accounts because i do have a lot of cash sitting around and that just goes to my personal money insecurities of i like having that there but you're right you're absolutely right um that some of that money is only earning you know less than a percent of interest in a uh, high yield savings account right now. So I have been converting some of it that I don't need in the short term mm. to just index fund investing. I'm a big index fund fan. I found somebody asking about crypto and I consider that kind of a uh, play money. Consider it your dessert mm. for investing. Okay. So put like the bulk of your meal into just straight old fun index funds that do the track the entire market. And that's had, I think a 10%, eight to 10%. Mm -hmm win every single year for how long um i do own a little bit of crypto but i consider it gambling money okay and i, I don't actually play with it that much it's just kind of fun to throw something into a stock that i might you know i own a little bit of starbucks <laughs> and other places where i regularly shop and i also own a little crypto but i wouldn't put your money that you're going to need in that mm -hmm. treat it purely speculatory investing and but no there's not a I mean, you could put something in a bond, but honestly, that's not going to mature even as much as inflation raises. Mm -hmm. So if it's not just sitting in your savings account, your high yield savings account, I would say index fund investing. Now, I am saving up for my next real estate property, but since that's going to be within the next couple of years, I am still keeping that in cash because you never know when the market's going to crash. Absolutely. Um, and so on that note, we've been talking about mistakes. Are there any others that we didn't mention? that you just, you got to make sure people avoid? Um, you know what? I just kind of mentioned one. I actually had some of my savings for this duplex in investments. Hmm. And I bought in March of last year. So I lost, uh, I think, about 1500 bucks because I had hmm. to pull that out when I was purchasing this duplex. So that is something you need to definitely not do. Make sure that anything you're going to use within the next one to three years, you're keeping that in cash. Mm. It's, it's very tempting to throw it into investments. And I know because I did it myself, it's very tempting, but don't do it. Keep the stuff you're going to need in the short term and keep some emergency funds mm -hmm. in cash because you never know when you're going to need to access those emergencies. Don't like to give you warning. All right. 
I think that's a great place to leave it. Folks, you heard it here. Sarah Wilson, budget girl, sharing about some of her biggest money mistakes and how you can avoid them. And make sure you tune in next week as well. We have another excellent guest. I'm Renita Young. This is Your Money Story on Quick Take. And enjoy your day.